Good evening. That was the first little morsel of Schumann's arabesque. And we're here again. My name's JP, Cats Chats 88 Keys. We are surrounded by cats, which let's be honest, doesn't always happen for these shows. Cats being the very uncompliant creatures that they so often are. We only just realized the other day that this basket was Tesla's favorite bed. Uh, so now it's a perfect little honey trap for him in here. Uh, there's one cat that's definitely ready to leave, because Tiller's never happy in here. Um, but yeah, there we go, a little whinge from her. Uh, that was the opening of Shima's Arabesque. Um, I thought it'd be a really nice foil um, to start the program with that. It provides a really lovely insight into the type of Schumann's writing, also the type of man he was as well. Um, sort of almost a little bit overly simplistic, almost a little bit childlike, which I think is the other reason it, it ties in very well with what else we're going to be doing today. And there's a certain, I always find this with Schumann, even in music which sounds outwardly quite contented, there's a certain, just a hint of mania about it. So if I play that beginning again, it's very charming, it's very beautiful, but the pattern of the music is very cyclical. The music is going around and around and around and around every beat. And the rhythm is exactly the same. These dotted rhythms repeating and repeating. And if you also listen to the fact that most of the time the melody is rising and very seldom falling, we get this feeling of restless searching, even within something quite seemingly harmless. The bit that comes after that is then a real attempt to make peace and to find some solace. Most keenly noted in the way that the music now does start to, to fall and sigh in its melodic line. Uh, then the melancholy comes much more overtly and we hear exactly the same theme but in the minor. before we hear everything we've just heard again and close the first section. And this opening theme, the opening section that I played you at the very beginning, is the central figure in what we call a rondo form. So that's when, if you were to give every section in a piece a letter of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, that's when you have a structure such as A, B, A, C, A, D, etc. And that is the A section that then comes back very many times during the work. And in between it, so if you like the B, the C and the D, are very different types of music. We're firmly in the minor now, there's no getting away from that. The music's a little bit slower and it's much more intense, it's much more emotionally laden. Um, it's a little bit frustrating as well. We now got these repeated two bar phrases, the first bar of which rises and the second bar of which falls. And then it happens again. And then the third time it happens, which normally in music you expect to be the, the time of deliverance, the time when we actually get to where we wanted to go, the third time it's actually lower and less, as if more resigned than the first two times. wends and winds its way and eventually reaches a big climax which leads us into the first truly uh, transcendental music in this work and the sort of sound world that was to become so much Schumann's hallmark as he got older. very lost, 
very suspended in time and space. And this leads us into our A section again, which attempts to divert us or distract us with a slightly lighter mood. And then the C section, so the second intervening episode, is a little bit more forthright. And now the dotted rhythm from the beginning, ta-team, 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 the dotted rhythm is anything that's quick, slow, quick, slow, quick, slow, is now taken on a slightly more um, confrontational air. This time when the A section returns it does so without any kind of preparation, it really takes us by surprise. If you like maybe a final attempt to find some peace and some light with all this clear heartache that's present behind it. But by far and away the most extraordinary part of this work is the very end. Um, we hear the A section one more time, exactly as before, and then you would expect the piece to end. And often in music, composers write what we call a coda, which literally means tail, and just something tagged onto the end just to kind of sum up everything we've heard so far. Schumann, as if, ends the piece, he then writes a new title, Zum Schluss, as if the end, and begins quite an extended coda that refers to the lost, suspended, transcendental music um, that we heard at the beginning. And this, not in the beginning, sorry, that we heard earlier on, but I played a bit of to you. And this is where I feel, for the first time, he allows the sadness in his heart to fully come to the fore of this piece of music. Schumann had, by this time, he was still a young man, 1839, so he was only 29 years old, he'd by this time pretty much given up hope of marrying Clara. Um, more on that later, but of course he was to marry her not so long, not so much time after this was written. But at the time he was in a period of such desolation about it, and I feel like you can really hear that coming through at several points. Schumann Arabesque. Enjoy. Oh, oh, I did want to say, um, yeah, just what an extraordinarily spellbinding way to begin a piece this is. It's so unassuming. And at the same time, it feels as if it might have been going on since the beginning of time, and we've just happened to peek behind the curtain into this other world. It doesn't announce itself. It doesn't confront you with the musical ideas. It just kind of suddenly starts out of the ether. It's an incredible piece. Oh, I should have said Bobby Kay's here. I mean, obviously. Who else would have provided the water? Well, there we are. There we are. So I, I drink to you with my H2O. Hydrate the cells. JP, I'll drink to you as well. Cheers, mate. Happy days. Happy Friday. Mm. Gabby's here, marshalling the camera and uh, trying to get some good shots of some sleeping cats. Mm. And Katie's here, doing something very devious looking in the background with a pad of paper. Yeah. I should say that it's our Bake Off this weekend. It's our return of the famed 42 Wag Bake Off, but now a Christmas edition. And so the house is pregnant with competitive spirit and general will to win.
Mm. I love how that ends with one final homage to the main theme of the piece as it leans up to the top one final time. Very touching. Um, yes, Schumann, in many ways, doubtless, really resonated with what he perceived to be, the, at least, the mind of a child. He was a very complex man, but he was not a particularly... He, he, he didn't find it very easy to conceal his emotions, let's put it like that. He, he wore his heart on his sleeve and kind of the idea of deviousness and, and sort of managing to, to hide what you're truly feeling was not something that, that really resonated with him. And so I've always thought that his music, and you can hear it at the beginning of that arabesque especially, has this kind of wide-eyed, childlike, almost naivety to its emotion. And indeed, it was after Clara had once said to him how like a child he seemed to her that he was inspired to write this next piece. So this is dated from just a little bit before the arabesque, about a year before. It was slightly happier times for Schumann. He had not completely given up hope with Clara yet. Um, the situation was that Clara's father was heartily disapproving of her uniting with someone with, as he saw it, as few prospects as Schumann. And he did a lot in order to create barriers between the two. So we're in 1838, their love has well and truly blossomed over a period of a good nine years. And you've got Clara's father moving her around Europe so that she cannot be wherever Schumann is. And not only doing that, but then using his influence to spread rumours about the other one to each of them, about how they found love elsewhere, about how they're seeing other people. So he was really maybe quite the opposite to Schumann in that regard, incredibly devious, incredibly capable of manipulation. And he was using every trick in the book to try and, try and thwart the young love. Um, famously, of course, he was unsuccessful, which we can all be very happy for. Um, so that's the backdrop to this, to this next work. Um, Schumann, when he was away from Clara, immersed himself in periods of hyper-productivity where he composed an absolute ton of music. And uh, he writes to her that as soon as he'd had the childlike inspiration or, or, or as soon as she'd said that to him, he immediately knocked off about 30 um, of these and then shows what we have now 13 to make the set Kindred Sane and Scenes from Childhood. Now these shouldn't be confused with his album for the young, which is a much larger set of pieces, which were written specifically for children or for, for young yeah, children and students, I guess, uh, to play. So they're slightly easier in their manner. These um, are rather beautifully described by Schumann as uh, rear view reflections from an elder for an elder. Um, I think the fact that he already views himself as an elder when he's only 28, I guess says a little bit about life expectancy at the time, um, but also just what a kind of deep thinker he was and how much life he felt he'd lived by then. Um, he did also say to Clara, you'll have to forget that you're a virtuoso when you play these. So while there's definitely nothing in them that is remotely simple pianistically, they're not flashy. One, one could argue not much of Schumann is, but, but some of it is. These are very heartfelt, deceptively simple, I think is the best way to describe them. Rather like a child, and I think that in many ways that's why this is such a clever um, set of pieces. These are scenes from childhood, but with the, with the sophistication of what an elder knows, but also with an idea that children are not as simple as they seem. And... They have hidden depths and they can surprise you. And there's a great amount of beauty anyway in the innocence and the naivety that they possess. So the first one, for example, uh, of foreign lands and peoples. Um, you, can, you can hear the wide-eyed gaze of a child as they imagine exotic and far away places.
The second one, A Curious Story. He plays rather a clever musical game here, so uh, we're in three in a bar. Normally in a, in a piece of music, the first beat is always the heaviest. But for the vast majority of this piece, he puts the heaviest or the loudest note always on the third beat of the bar. So instead of feeling one, two, three, one, two, three, which makes us feel very stable and very kind of like we know where we are, most of this piece goes three, one, two, three, one, two. And this gives this piece the, this element of, of eccentricity in the, in the curiousness of the story. But also, there's a certain amount of anticipation afforded to each third beat, and that's or at very least makes me feel like that's evoking the person being told the story, eager to hear what happens next, or even the energy with which the storyteller is narrating each different step of the way. is titled Blind Man's Bluff. Um, this is a game where you blindfold someone and then they have to try and catch you. Obviously they can't see you so you are calling out to them and then they are trying to chase you and find you based on uh, your call. But you're moving as well so it's rather a chaotic game. And here you can hear the helter-skelter running passage work of the children playing and he puts in these accents every now and then and that's clearly um, either someone being caught or, I think more likely, people shouting out to the slightly wayward and confused blindfold E. <laughs> The next one, Pleading Child, makes use of an echo very effectively. So, interestingly, it's got the same melodic outline as the very first piece, as Foreign Lands and Peoples, which was... And this one starts... So it's the same tune, but it's so differently harmonised you barely recognise it. And all Schumann does for this whole one is he plays two bars quite loudly and then echoes it very much to suggest a child asking for something and then pleading with a sort of faux pathetic, over-the-top kind of uh, theatricality. very effective. Most of the time there's quite a clear break between these movements, but at the end of this one he leaves us hanging in the air and we go straight into the next one, happy enough. And I think the word enough here is very crucial because this is not an overtly happy piece, but it chugs along fairly contentedly. And to me again it feels like the pleading child has been somewhat appeased by the parents. There's a compromise has been struck. Maybe not both sides are, have got exactly what they wanted, but there's no more pleading. And actually the way this is written is very effective because there's a melody in the right hand which could definitely suggest the child's voice, and then it's having a conversation with a melody in the left hand answering it much lower down, which obviously relates more to a parent. one, an important event, uh, very much speaks for itself. It is um, grand, pompous, um, and makes great use of dotted rhythms. Then we come to the centre point of the work, and this is central in two ways really. First of all, literally, uh, it's number 7 out of 13 but also harmonically. So before then, we've been largely wandering around the same three keys, which are very interconnected. G major, and the key a fifth up from that, D major, and the key a fifth up from that, A major. And they all, as you can tell, I think when I play the chords, you can tell that they're all kind of in the same family. 
The start of the next one, Dreaming, moves us straight to F major. Which, from any of those, from D major for example, to F, is a much more alien departure. And that really anchors us in uh, this new key area for quite a while. And it takes us three or four pieces to slowly wend our way back to the G major that we started. This is one of his most famous works. Um, it's been taken out as encores and arranged for lots of different instruments. Um, it starts with the same two note motif, a sort of rising question, but a rising question fairly embedded in reality. And then takes us somewhere else. The most matter of fact being that one, and that one already is a fairly special harmonic change and then the phrase comes back down. The second time we go to the minor. Then he takes us on two more extended journeys through a minor key, and eventually when we come back home, the third time takes us to... And he even puts a pause on that note so as to really exaggerate quite how lost and suspended in time and space we are. Uh, the next one, at the fireside, begins with exactly the same two note motif. And I think therefore shares some kind of connection with the previous one. Maybe it's the same person, slightly more in reality now. Um, and there's this wonderfully cosy feel um, very comforting music. I think one of the things I was thinking today that is so extraordinary about this music is that he's managing to tackle subject matter that could easily be kind of a little bit cutesy. It could easily be a little bit stomach churning and a bit too blech. And he manages to do it with such kind of elegance and, and charm, but with such sincerity and realness that I think it's it, it avoids that, which I think is, is a remarkable achievement, actually. The next one has a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek vibe to it. It's the Knight of the Hobby Horse. Knight spelt with a knight. And this is rhythmically very fun. Um, it's, ag again, as the second piece um, was doing, it's accentuating the weakest beats of the bar. But also the right hand is constantly a tiny bit displaced from the left hand, which gives us this feeling of... Uh, of rocking, but a slightly maniacal, uh, unstable, almost crazed rocking of a rocking horse. The next piece is called Almost Too Serious, and I think it's one of the more um, complicated of the set. Um, for me, it's talking about a child being almost too serious, so the, the kind of child who you slightly wonder if if they've lost their joy somewhere along the way and, and watching a child without joy is, is a very disconcerting thing. They're capable of very interesting observations, very profound thoughts, but you, you just get a little bit concerned for them. There's, there's a degree of inscrutability of this next piece and it's, it's, it feels stable when you listen just to the right hand. But actually that's all against the main beat. And so when you put it with the left hand, it sounds a bit less stable. Number 11 is called Frightening. And this is a slightly longer and more multi-layered um, little work. Um, there's a key monster under the bed element that rears its head twice in some faster music. And for the rest of the time, or for most of the rest of the time, the protagonist seems to be worried about that. This amazing chromatic descending thirds in the left hand. 
taking us into very, very unfamiliar and disconcerting harmonic territory. There's one moment of seeming triumph, or at least of, of, of willful blindness to the horror, um, which only lasts for about 10 seconds. Before the shadows start to return. back to the main material. Um, and the next one, the child who's been frightened by the monsters under the bed is finally managing to fall asleep. Um, it's called Child Falling Asleep and you can very clearly hear the rocking, um, lilting vibe of a child being hushed and rocked. I think, again, purely personally, I think there's a protagonist with the child here. I think a parent is soothing the child and is rocking it to sleep. More on that in a second. You can hear the music still doesn't sound particularly um, reconciled. Um, it's slow and rocking, sure, but we're still well and truly in the minor. And then there comes this unbelievably beautiful, radiant, central major section, which to me, again, feels like the kind of thing... Well, the first section of it feels like the parent has maybe started to sing to the child. It's so tender and so peace-bringing. a little bit darker and he starts to deploy suspensions and dissonances um, which because of the way he sets them up and resolves them gives me a very strong uh, sacred feeling a very strong idea of, of, of a church setting and I think in this case possibly the idea of someone praying again I, I can hear the, the parent praying for the child to sleep well or to be healthy or to be happy material returns and he winds the child down into total slumber with the most beautiful cycle of fifths. And then comes the last one, The Poet Speaks. The pianist Corto described this as an intimate reverie and he said that one should not play it, one should dream it. Um, so it's a real challenge for the performer to do as little as they can to not be too present in what's going on just to allow the music to unfold it's one of these moments you get with all great composers um, where you feel like real truth is being delivered and because of the nature of this piece and because of Schumann as well it, it's truth through the lens of uh, a childlike persona that kind of immaculate purity that speaks the truth to the world. Um, there's a little cadenza in the middle, and then it comes back and just sinks and dies away into the distance. One other amazing thing Corto said was that when it comes back after the com composer, um, the music, or this, this last bit, seems to be drawn from the immortal spirit of the work as a whole, which I think is just lovely. So, here we are. I wanted to dedicate this to Ben. We talked about me doing this in one of these a long time ago, because bless you, you've been watching ever since the very beginning. Um, I've never met Ben. Um, we, we met via email, and we've been writing to each other through both lockdowns through these shows and I've spoken before about how weird it feels sometimes doing these because a hundred, two hundred, few hundred people might be watching but I can't really tell and you never really know 
what it's doing for anyone. And it's been beautiful having a few of you like Ben who've been writing to me pretty much every week. And Ben, it's been an absolute delight. I've loved getting to know you and talking about music and life and everything. It's felt like having a pen pal, which I haven't had for nearly 20 years. And um, I very much look forward to when all this nonsense is over, getting some beers in and um, yeah, getting to know you a bit better. But thank you, it's Kinder Sane and for you. two very deeply sleeping cats, which I feel for this piece couldn't be any better. Perfect. Perfect.
There we are. A touching way to end the show. Schumann's Kindertainer. I know what we're all thinking throughout that. Is how did Bobby Kay get on with the old subtitles? I think he did all right. Ah, well, there we go. A miracle, given that he's never heard that piece before and was on a wing. But we actually had a secret tell between the two of us. And uh, I'm wondering if any of you clocked what that might have been. So there we are. Another week rolls by. I will be back next week. I'm not quite sure with what. Um, I know that I'm going to play a couple of Darren's beautiful pieces, but I don't know what I'm going to put with them. But yeah, there'll be a show because we're sort of stuck right now. I'm sure we're all a little bit more positive about the vaccine news that's coming out. Although if you're like me, you'll be maybe wishing that we had a slightly different government to administer such a large scale vaccine. But who knows, maybe we can be positive and imagine that they uh, might discover some competence in the next few months. I won't hold my breath, but just possibly. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the concert, please feel free, if you can spare it, to kick in a few quid. It would mean a lot at a time when there's not really much else going on for me concerts wise. And also like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, sign up to the Facebook page, you know it makes perfect sense. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week. Woo! Thank you very much.